I'm preaching a message today that I'm calling Ananias said it. Ananias said it. And Ananias was a, a man that God showed to Saul right when Saul gets saved. Saul, who would later become the apostle Paul by name, uh, gets radically saved uh, and, and he encounters Christ. And when he encounters Christ, uh, the encounter was so tangible, so strong that it, it actually blinds him. He becomes blind. And so Paul is praying and he's blind and he just had this new encounter with Jesus trying to figure out what's next. And in Acts chapter 9, verse 10, God uses this man named Ananias. And it reads like this. It says, now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he says, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind and arrest all who call on your name. Verse 15 says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. That and, and, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Ananias said it. Come on, let's pray together today over the preaching of God's word. God, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray you'd give us eyes to see the needs of those around us, and God, I pray that our belief in others would would grow, and our belief in what you can do in their life would grow. Help us to hear your voice and respond always with a resounding okay, Lord. We want to be faithful and obedient to what you've called us to. Lord, we love you. We need you. In Jesus' name, and we all said, amen. Amen. Uh, have you ever met somebody that loves mirrors? Come on, you, you, you ever meet somebody and like if there is a mirror within like a two-mile radius, they're going to find it? You know what I mean? Like they're, they're, always, they're always looking in the mirror. They, they, you know, they're, they're always kind of like checking themselves out. They're always, you know, they're, just, they're just in, in the mirror a lot, right? They're, they're in the mirror a lot. And uh, um, it's, it, it's interesting. Our, our daughter um, might be becoming one of those people, and I'm trying to disciple it out of her. <laughs> and this came into full bloom uh, this last week. Uh, our, our cousin, their cousins were over at the house, and uh, our, my uh, brother and sister-in-law, uh, uh, Robbie and Charity were, were uh, staying at our house and their kids. And so they love when their cousins come around. Their cousins are older. Uh, they're also, uh, they're not twins, but they're, you know, boy, girl, 15 and 13. And so, so they love it. They love when their cousins are around. Uh, but on one particular day, uh, their cousins and Justice, they, 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 were, they were playing outside and, A and Adriana was inside, right? She was inside. And what was separating them was our, um, you know, glass slider, and Adriana was dancing in front of the glass slider. She was just dancing, right? There's no music going on. She was just dancing. And while she was dancing, she was looking intently at her cousins and her brother. At least so I thought. As she was looking at them, I was like, is she trying to get their attention? Is she trying to, like, be a show pony right now? Like, is she trying to show off a little bit? I was so confused. But then it dawned on me. I, I looked a little closer. And I go, oh, She's not looking at anybody on the other side of that glass. She's looking at herself in the glass. See, what's interesting about mirror people is they'll turn anything into a mirror. They'll, tune a, they'll turn a spoon into a mirror. They'll, they'll, tune, uh, uh, they'll turn uh, see-through glass into a mirror. And this is, this is what she was doing. And here's what you have to understand about Christianity. Christ Christianity has both. It has windows and mirrors, right? It has windows and mirrors. And, and no judgment um, when you are in the moments of mere Christianity, 
By the way, we will all have moments and seasons and even moments in a day where you need some mere Christianity. And what I mean by mere Christianity is when you are looking at yourself through the prism of how Christ sees you. That is an important aspect of our faith. Right, where, where you're looking at yourself and you're going, man, no matter what my conscience tells me, no matter what this world tells me, no matter what my poor decisions tell me, uh, I am free, I am forgiven, I am loved, I am a son, I am a daughter. That is mere Christianity, where, where the focus is yourself and Christ's work in you. However, if your entire Christianity is oriented around the mirror, uh, you're missing it just a little bit. There has to be some glass to your Christianity. There has to be some application of the grace of God, the calling of God, the mercy of God, and it has to not just apply to you whom you can see when you're looking in a mirror, but it has to apply to others when you're looking out the window. And here's my point, my main point today is this, is that Ananias believed in Paul because he believed in the power of God to change lives. See, he, he believed in Paul, but he didn't just believe in Paul from a self-help declaration type of way, right? You and I, like, in fact, the only thing that I believe about humanity is our ability to destroy our lives. We're good at that. We're amazing at that, right? So when I say, hey, we ought to believe in people, even ourselves, man, we got to believe in ourselves. It's not because we're awesome, it's not because we're particularly strong or we're particularly wise, but I believe in people. Why? Because I have seen God change people's lives, of which I am one. Right? And, and so there has to be this component of, man, I'm going to believe in people, not because people always make the right decisions or people are always awesome, but because God can change hearts. God can take a heart of stone and turn it into a heart of flesh. And what a story about Ananias. It says there's this disciple, his name's Ananias. The Lord gives him a vision, and he starts out by saying, Ananias, and here's his response. He says, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, I want you to go to Straight Street, and there's a house of Judas. I want you to look for a man named Saul. And behold, right now he is praying, and he has seen you in a vision. Come and lay hands on him so that he might re regain his sight. See, sometimes the hardest part about this okay statement of obedience and faithfulness is starting off. See, sometimes the hardest part is getting momentum at the beginning. And you know when you have momentum, right? Momentum is a beautiful thing. In fact, I remember when Christina's sister, who was actually just here, uh, uh, Charity, she was um, uh, hanging out with one of my roommates and there was this kind of end of the year event that was called Banquet at our university that was coming up. And uh, uh, it was me and another one of my roommates uh, that was also on the basketball team. Uh, her sister was trying to uh, uh, hook Christina up with one of us for this event. So she goes, hey, I, I've been hang hanging out with this guy and he lives with these two guys that are on the basketball team and one of them's Andrew and the other's name is X and footnote in the story and uh and uh she said hey, hey hey these are the the two guys and i think they're both great i think they're both amazing you should go to banquet with one of these two guys and so you know christy's like ah eh. she's like well i'll let me bring bring you to a basketball game so you can like see them <laughs> now let's be honest if that was uh, gender reverse that would be very objectified and that's exactly what was happening even now as i'm telling the story and so Christina comes to a game to, I, I guess, decide <laughs> who she would like her, her sister to connect her with. Now, there's good news in this story. The good news is um, I played a lot. The bad news for the other guy is he didn't. <laughs> and so I remember by the first time we had that first date, I go, oh, if that was the tryout, feeling pretty good about the momentum I have currently. I'm feeling good about my pole position. See, see, it's interesting. Like that didn't do all the work. I still had to not be a monster, right? I, I still had, I, I still had to like, like do some things to win her heart, win her affection. See, mo momentum is always critical at the very beginning, right? You have to get momentum before you can walk in your destiny. You got to start. 
Before you can get to a place, you gotta have early momentum. Now, now think about this for a second. Ananias has early momentum. How do we know he has early momentum? Because of the way he responds to the initial call even before he's given any instruction. See, see when he says this, when the Lord says Ananias, and he says, here I am, Lord, you have to understand, in the original language, he's not simply saying, I'm in the living room. That's not what he's saying. He, he is saying, Lord, here I am, I am available for whatever you want to say. Like, like, that is what he is saying. He's not just kind of giving a, God a point of direction. God already knows where he's at. He's saying, God, I am here, and I am ready to follow you no matter what you call me to. So what does he have early on? He's got early momentum. If you're going to follow God, if you're going to obey God in the hard stuff, you have to develop a knee-jerk reaction of obedience. So when you sense God is up to something or you sense God is getting ready to say something, you have a here I am type of response because there are a lot of people waiting for you to respond. There are a lot of people. In, in fact, every time just about, whether it's in the scriptures or maybe in your reflection upon your life, every time you prayed for something or every time God moved in the Bible, he always sent a person. He always sends a person. The people of Israel, what are they praying for? They're praying for deliverance out of slavery. And what does God do? He sends a Moses. The soldiers are terrified of Goliath. They're praying for victory over Goliath. What does God do? Sends him David. Humanity is racked with guilt and shame and condemnation because of our sins. What does God do? He sends Jesus. And the Apostle Paul is a little confused in his newfound faith and trust in Jesus. In fact, he's literally blind. What does God do? He sends him Ananias. I wonder how many people are praying for you. And I don't mean praying for you in terms of a mirror. I mean praying for you in terms of a window. I wonder how many people are praying for a friend and God's trying to send you to them. I wonder how many people are praying for a mentor, for a new parent, and God's trying to get your attention. But because we haven't developed the knee-jerk reaction of a here I am, Lord, there's some delay. And I don't know about you, but man, I, I want to be able to respond to people's prayer. And I don't care how equipped you think you are or how equipped you think you are. I don't care how old you are. I don't care if you've been walking with Jesus for a cup of coffee or for 50 years. Uh, God is going to call you and you have the potential to be the fulfillment of somebody else's okay. See, God wants to fulfill some okay, some obedient. God wants to call some people, but he's going to use you to unlock it. In fact, I... Uh, uh, I, I didn't know that I was gonna, I was gonna need uh, uh, somebody. In, in, in fact, on Tuesday, our water heater goes out. Water heater goes out on Tuesday, and so it was cold showers for the last like four days. And uh, ironically enough, our water heater goes out, and then the next day, Christina flies out. So she's taking hot showers at the hotel she was at. She was, you know, she was, she was feeling great, right, you know? So, so she flies out, and she helps set up, and, and, and we had to call somebody on Tuesday night. We didn't know who to call, so we, 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 we call uh, kind of this company. They come out, and they couldn't really do anything, and so we called the company that put it in uh, like the next day, and they had ordered this piece, and, and we are waiting for this, and it was kind of like the engine of the whole thing. So we're waiting for this piece to come in, and it's cold showers. Now, cold showers are awesome when you chose them. Cold showers are not as awesome when, you know, it is not optional. And so I'm entertained. And, and if you know me, you know I take like three to four showers a day. I take a lot of showers. So this is like, like debilitating for me. And my kids are doing it way better with it than I am, right? And, and I remember on, on Thursday night, this guy comes, who, who, you know, like their company put it in. And an awesome guy, incredible guy. And I was hoping he could fix it without the piece, and he couldn't. The piece was supposed to be in Thursday. It didn't come in Thursday, and they're like, we're not sure where it is. Maybe it'll come in Friday morning. And so I'm, I'm talking to uh, the guy that was there working on Thursday, and I go, hey, man, if that piece comes in on Friday to this other company, I will drive and go get it. Is there any way that you can come 
if that piece comes in and put this thing in tomorrow, and he looks at his calendar and he goes, man, I am swamped. Like, I am, I am like nonstop. And I go, and he goes, let me, let me call my boss and, and, and let me call you back. So he calls his boss, he calls me back. And the man of God named Aaron calls me back. <laughs> and he goes, hey man, uh, I'm gonna move a few things around so that I can be a little liquid tomorrow, and if that thing comes in, here's my cell phone number, just call me as, you know, as soon as it comes in to see if I have time to do it tomorrow. Sure enough, on Friday, I got a text message, hey, the piece is in at like 10 o'clock. I'm like, I'm on my way. I jump in the car, I call my new best friend, Aaron. <laughs> and I say, Aaron, the piece is in. He goes, I'm on my way to a job right now. I'll be there for an hour. I'll be at your house in about an hour and a half. And I said, Aaron, God bless you. I didn't know I was going to need Aaron. I thought I just wanted a hot shower. And every single time, people think that they know what they want. People think they know how this thing's going to play out in their life. And God is going to send you. God is going to want to send you. And so if you and I can have a constant reminder in our spirit saying, God, uh, use me in the lives of other people. You're going to see God do incredible things in your life. But Ananias had a question. And his question was fair, right? God tells him, hey, you're going to go to Saul. I, by the way, I, I love that uh, God doesn't really say who Saul was because sometimes I wonder, I'm like, uh, maybe, maybe Ananias hasn't heard about this dude. <laughs> so I was like, hey, you're going to go to this guy. His name's Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> and you're going to pray for him. And Ananias is like, um, I'm sorry, did you say Saul? And in verse 13, he says, Lord, I've heard about this man, <laughs> how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he actually has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. See, Anan Ananias' hesitation would have been understandable because we all in our past have gotten burned by believing in the wrong person. Every single one of us has probably, if we were to reflect, has had a moment where we're like, man, I put my faith in the wrong person. I believed in the wrong person. I, I remember there was a, a young man that, uh, man, we loved and still love to this day, and uh, his name was Mike, and when we were uh, young adult pastors in the Seattle area, uh, Mike, he just kind of had a difficult background. He, he kind of came up in a, in a difficult home and uh, never really had a father, and at this time, he's like 19, 20 years old, and uh, uh, Mike actually lived with us for a season of his life and had really struggled with, with drugs and had really struggled with just, just anger and physical violence and stuff like that. And, and so Mike, Mike lived with us for a season and then he actually um, started our internship program. He started our internship program like a month in. Um, he threatens one of the other students and we're like, Mike, no. Like, you know, like... <laughs> You can't do that, bro. So, so I actually have to like kick him out of our internship program and, and, and he would be around the church a lot and then we wouldn't see him for like months at a time. And, and he was living with us for a while and um, at the end, I remember sitting down with him uh, at a coffee shop and he said, hey man, uh, I, I'm gonna move back in with my mom and him and his mom had a very tense relationship but the reason, and his motives were right, the reason why he wanted to move back home is he had a younger brother, and now that he was kind of, you know, doing life right, he wanted to be an example for his little brother. And to be honest, even at that coffee shop, I tried to talk him out of it. Because one of the things that I told him, I said, hey, Mike, sometimes we need to learn how to sprint before we can help other people crawl. And so I'm like, I think you're still learning how to sprint. And so, you know, you, you shouldn't feel the responsibility to go back in, until you feel, and he's like, man, I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do. And I said, man, I love you either way. And so he goes back, doesn't work out. And after a few years, kind of ends up homeless. And so at this point, he's homeless, and he spent so much time on the streets and doing drugs that he would, like, talk to himself. So, he, so we'd be in the car driving, and I'd pick him up, and he would just be, like, looking out the window, like, talking to himself. And I just, I just loved him to pieces, believed in him. And, uh, and, and it was, like, 4th of July uh, weekend, and 
uh, there was an event that we, do, that we did every 4th of July. It was a massive 4th of July event. There'd be a 5K and a 10K, a three-on-three basketball tournament. Thousands of people would uh, come to this event. And Mike was, this was one of those seasons where Mike was around. So I said, hey, Mike, come just hang with me all weekend at the basketball tournament. And we'll just hang out. Help me, help me run this thing and we'll hang out. My executive pastor meets with me and he's like, hey, I feel like really uncomfortable with Mike being around. And I was like, man, I was kind of judgmental to my executive pastor. I was like, no, man, he's fine. He's going to be fine, right? I'm like, it's all good. Well, um, uh, the weekend ended with Mike getting in a fist fight with one of the other guys that were there. Actually, it was one of the leaders in our young adult ministry who was a great guy. He ends up getting in a fight and to the point where I'm sprinting after Mike and yelling, Mike, 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 and I'm grabbing him and I'm lifting him out of the space and he ends up like walking off and, and, and I end up jumping in the car. Our executive pastor was like, hey, Andrew, like for safety reasons, we cannot have Mike at the church anymore. And now I'm like, you were right. <laughs> and I get in my vehicle, I'm driving around, I find Mike and I'm like, Mike, like man, what happened? He tells me what happened and it was 100% his fault. And I was like, Mike, you can't come in the church anymore because people feel unsafe. And he goes, why? And he just didn't, it's just where he was, right? He just, he just, he just didn't, didn't under, understand it. And it's one of those things where you can look at that scenario and go, man, like, like was I wrong? And I gotta be honest, I, I, have, I have reflected on this many times. I've reflected on this many times. And upon my reflection, I, I really had this thought. It, it, I didn't believe in the wrong person. I wanted to see it through. And I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can be calloused instead of cautious, and we can be withholding instead of wise. And I've been wrong about people before, but I've never been wrong for believing in them. And I think that you and I have to make sure that we guard our heart. And just because maybe it hasn't worked out, maybe every person that you invested in, maybe every time that you kind of vouch for somebody, it didn't work out, uh, that doesn't mean that you get to stop investing and vouching for people. In, in fact, Jesus tells this parable, and he says what? He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer that went out to scatter some seed. And he tells this illustration, and he tells this story. And in his illustration, 75% of the seed falls on soil that doesn't produce a harvest. 25% of the seed falls on good soil, which produces a harvest. And so even in Jesus' own illustration, he's saying, look, you are going to pour out a lot, and you're going to invest a lot, and not every time you invest is there going to be a return. But what I've come to the conclusion is, is very simple. The more seed I scatter, the greater the harvest. See, a lot of times we get overly discouraged. Why? Because we scattered like three seeds and we're like, oh man, we, we in, I invested in that person and it didn't work out. I invested, you know, and it doesn't always have to be spiritual. Sometimes it's you invested in a business person. You invested in somebody's creativity. You invested in, in a young person or whatever the case may be and it didn't work out. You and I do not get to start tuning God out when he calls us to other people. See, what I found is, listen, there's a lot of people that I've invested in and it didn't work out, but by the grace of God, there's a lot of people that I have invested in and it did work out. And I'm not gonna allow the times that it didn't work out. Now, now think about this for a second. Like, could you imagine if Ananias would have been like, nah, I've led a city group before. It didn't really work out. And nobody came. And I built that friendship, you know, with that person. And then they started talking about me behind my back. And uh, can you imagine if Ananias would have been like, nah, like, I'm good, man. I just want to invest in the people that are a sure thing. I, I just really want to invest in the people. They're going to take what I give them, and they're going to steward it well. And they're... Come on, the person he invested in ends up becoming the Apostle Paul. And at that time, he was not the Apostle Paul. He was Saul, like the murderous, like high priest that, that, that like was, was stepping out and arresting Christians at the time. And I think you and I got to make sure that we don't tune people out, that we don't allow our, our hearts to become calloused. And in verse 15, Ananias asked the question, but in verse 15, I want to have the team come up. It says, the Lord says to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. And it says that he goes and he prays, and I love that it says he calls him Brother Saul. 
And in verse 18, it says, and immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose, he was baptized, he ate some food, and he was strengthened. You see, I know the feeling of what it is like to give my heart to Christ and to have some people belittle it and some people champion it. I I know what it's like to give my heart to Christ and to have some people go, we'll see. Ah, we'll see. Come on, some of, you, some of you in this room, some of you watching online, you know what it's like that the second you started giving your heart to Christ, you had some friends around you go, no, no, I know her. No, 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 I know who he is. You had some family members that are like, ah, we'll see. She's tried this before. Right? We, we have had moments like that. And, and, and can I tell you, I had people like that in my life. I remember I had Christians that are like, no, I know who he is. He, no, 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 he, this, this will not stick. But praise God that there were some faithful men and women of God that fanned into flame the gift of what God was doing in my life and that they didn't just stand off and said, no, no, I'll invest when it's safe. I'll invest when I, when I know there's a return. I, I, I think we, we want guarantees and there's no guarantees in this thing. Instead, it's just like, man, I'm going to invest in as many people as I can. I'm going to have my ears in tune. I'm going to have my spiritual eyes alert every single day so that when I go to work and when I go to school, man, Lord, I'm ready for you to use me in the lives of other people. And I'm not going to let, and I'm not going to let past hurt stop me from doing that. We got to stop holding people hostage for who they used to be. Because I don't like being held hostage for who I used to be. See, what's interesting is (laughs) the same thing that we love about God is the same thing that really annoys us about God. See, the thing we love about God when we're holding up the mirror is this, that no matter who I am and no matter what I've done, God's grace is sufficient. And though my sin was like scarlet, I'm clean And God wants to take all the sum totality of who I am, and he wants to use me. That's the mere part that we love. But the window part can be frustrating. Can I be? We're in church, right? So we can just say whatever. (laughs) You ever seen God use somebody? And you're like, why? Why? Because the same thing that you love about them as it pertains to you can be the same thing that drives you crazy as it pertains to other people. The fact that he is not a respecter of persons, that he has removed their sin as far as the east is from the west. The fact that he does not hold their past against them. The fact that he wants to use them in a profound way. So what you and I have to start doing is we have to start aligning ourselves with the appraisal of God. We need to start aligning ourselves with the appraisal of God. There's a show that periodically I'll watch if I kind of just stumble upon it. It's, it's a pawn shop show. It's a pawn shop show. And there's um, sometimes how it works out is these people will come out, uh, uh, come into the pawn shop with these really rare artifacts or these really rare things. And they're trying to sell this to the pawn shop. And, and the guy that works at the pawn shop, he always has a guy. Right, he always has a guy. He always has a guy that's an expert on that Civil War uh, uh, sword uh, that that guy brought in, or the baseball. Co- like he always has a guy that's an expert on whatever that thing is. And so he calls his expert, and he's like, "Hey, you know." And so the expert comes in, and the person that's waiting with bated breath to see whether or not this artifact is legit or not is the person that brought it in. And sometimes the way it goes is the person's like, "Ah, oh, this isn't." No, this isn't the thing. And, 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 and this expert is giving their appraisal, and the amateur over here is going, nah, I don't know. I don't know. That is you and I, my friends. We are the amateur appraisers. And the expert appraiser has said, this is my son, this is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. I died for this person, I have purchased this person with a high price, I have a calling, I have an assignment on their life. And the amateur appraisers are over here going, I don't know. I don't know, I heard something about who they used to be five years ago. We need to stop that. 
we need to start aligning ourselves to go, God, you are the master appraiser. I am the amateur appraiser. And my appraisal at the end of the day doesn't mean very much. The appraisal that matters is the appraisal of God that calls people son and daughter and that puts a plan and assignment on people's life that you and I hopefully, if we're paying attention by the grace of God, we'll get to partner with some of that. So come on, let's stand to our feet, Grace City Church. And I'm gonna ask that we would bow our head.